Hello, my name is Jessica Gerard and I'm speaking to you from sunny Melbourne. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm an Australian, but I um, became absolutely fascinated with the Socialist Sunday School movement when I was over in England completing my studies and I ended up dedicating a great deal of my PhD to studying this movement. So I'm simply delighted to be um, engaging in this dialogue with you, although I know that I'm having to do it via this recording. I'm I'm afraid even the time differences mean that I, I can't be there in person. I've got two young children and it just doesn't work um, between UK and here. Um, but I'm thrilled to be doing this and I hope that you find this interesting and um, I'm, I'm sure you will because this is um, a little known but I think very important educational movement. This radical children's educational movement offers such an important insight into the social history of childhood more generally but also into the history of social movements and socialism across Great Britain. Unfortunately, thanks to some carefully kept archives, there's quite a lot of material around Socialist Sunday Schools. Uh, when I was doing the research, I was able to access um, an impressive collection of school-based materials at the Manchester Labour History Archive, um, alongside some oral history recordings that were conducted in the 1970s of suffragettes, some of whom had attended Socialist Sunday Schools as children, so there were some beautiful remembrances of their time as children and even some renditions of the songs from from their time as um, at the school, um, as well as a range of press clippings and government reports and so on. Um, and I also suspect that there's quite a lot of little bits and bobs around this movement um, in local uh, council and local government archives. Um, uh, and I perhaps there are some even where you are. Um, so whilst the movement isn't particularly well known, it's from what I can tell, it's the longest running independent community based working class children's educational initiative. It started in 1892 and it was running right up until the mid 1970s, though with much decreased numbers. Um, and whilst they only ever amassed about 10,000 adult and children followers in their peak in the 1920s, it was very much a popular movement and very embedded within the broader socialist movement at the time. So I thought what I'd do is take you on a bit of a scrapbook tour of the Socialist Sunday School movement. Um, I'm going to try and keep to about a brief 15 minutes. Um, and for those who are interested, I have got a number of publications. I wrote a book that's um, very much dedicated to this and the other um, schooling movement that I also researched from my doctorate, which was the Black Supplementary School Movement, which was uh, started in the mid 20th century, around the 1960s, by African Caribbean parents. Some really interesting intersections across the two movements. Um, and also a couple of publications there just on the Socialist Sunday School Movement. But before I even begin with the schools themselves, I thought I would pull out what I could find about Govan Hill itself. Um, I found this excerpt from uh, a PhD thesis by Neil Rafik from the 1970s that's about women in the Communist Party in Scotland. And he uses Govan Hill School as an example of um, the um, growth and flourishing of the Socialist Sunday School more broadly and actually has the numbers there on um, enrolment and boys and girls and so on um, involved in the school. And then I have also this wonderful excerpt which is um, from the Socialist Sunday School magazine called The Young Socialist had a paper, a page called The Children's Pages where young uh, the young children could write in the students could write in about their experiences so flora was the editor of the children's page so this is a um this is ella from govan hill social sunday school writing in saying i thought i would let you know about the social we had it was a great success we had a pleasant evening games dancing action songs solos and readings all were delighted with it our second anniversary will be Sunday. We are still making new members, though some have left the city and others have gone abroad. We have play classes every Saturday and Miss Hannon teaches us all sorts of games and actions. Apologies for the couple of typos there. We are practicing the Scottish Scotch reel and a Morris dance for the Kinderspiel, which takes place in February. Yours fraternally, Ellie Edwards, or Ella Edwards. 
Okay, so what I might do is just start with a bit of an introduction to the movement and what I really like to focus on is how the movements understood their purpose in terms of constructing an alternative form of childhood. So to introduce the Socialist Sunday School, you have to start with Mary Gray. So this is Mary Gray here, pictured with her daughter Florence. Mary and Florence make up two of the three first attendees of the first Socialist Sunday School, when in 1892, Mary, a dedicated Social Democratic Federation member, decided to open the first Socialist Sunday School, the Battersea Socialist Sunday School, attended also by Florence's friend and neighbour, Ernest. At this point, it's worth noting that Mary, uh, Mary's initiative wasn't the first attempt of turn of the century radicals to transform or to shift the culture of children's lives and education. Socialists were prominent in interventionist campaigns for free school meals, secular education, raising the school leaving age, as well as campaigning and uh, running for serving on school boards um, and actively um, developing alternative children's culture and literature. So you have here, for instance, from within the socialist ranks, Keir Hardy and Archie MacArthur, who had the pen names Daddy Time and Uncle Archie, respectively, were busy recruiting children for what they called Labour Crusaders from the column Chats with the Crusaders in the pages of the Labour Leader newspaper, um, which you can see there in the slide. Uh, in addition, Robert Blatchford, who was editor of the popular left-wing newsletter newspaper, The Clarion, he was a keen advocate of Cinderella clubs, which were predominantly connected to the Labour Church and um, were the kind of the Labour Church version of the Socialist Sunday Schools. And there's a kind of link in some ways between those two groups. Um, and at the turn of the century was also, there was the Moral Instruction League, which involved F.J. Gould um, and a whole range of different um, initiatives that were trying to rethink what morals and ethics might be from a socialist or um, humanist perspective. I've put there um, a teacher's handbook of moral lessons that was published around 1904. So the point being that when Mary opened the first Socialist Sunday School, she entered into an existing, albeit small, collection of children's socialist cultural and educational initiatives. The schools were an extension of the socialist movement and children proudly marched with their parents and schools at large demonstrations, as you can see in this picture here. And whilst it is true that the schools provided an avenue and outlet for many socialist women, it's also important to say that the movement had both men and women leaders and that at times it did explicitly resist being called or being understood as the women's auxiliary of the socialist movement, which is a difference between the UK Socialist Sunday Schools and the North American Socialist Sunday Schools, which were more explicitly positioned as the women's auxiliary. Um, it's also important to note that the leaders of the Socialist Sunday School movement were very keen on ensuring that the schools themselves were not attached to any particular political party, but were across all of the different socialist groupings at the time. Um, they really wanted to create a broad environment and culture of socialism for children that didn't get bogged down into the fierce political debates of the day. Um, so to describe the schools themselves, they met on the one day available for workers at the time, Sunday. They operated within locales of socialist activities. So if there was a visiting socialist speaker coming around, they would also come along to the school. Um, the parents would be involved in various political associations, in parties, there'd be soup kitchens, trade union activities, rambling, cycling clubs, reading circles, women's circles. And they taught an impressive array of curriculum. I have to say, I was really um, surprised to see the level of development in curriculum for this community movement. They had materials about teaching science, literature, socialist historical analysis, cooperative ethics, and they involved children in a whole range of activities, needlecraft, rambling, singing. Um, and they really took their remit to introduce children to a different political and moral epistemology seriously. 
They had their own organisational structures. There was the National Council of British Socialist Sunday Schools, which was established in 1909. In 1901, the Young Socialist, their magazine, started circulation, and that included poems and stories for children, school reports, but also lesson ideas for teachers and short biographies of teachers and students, reports from major social campaigns, um, uh, opinion and analysis from key socialist members at the time. The schools initially had a connection to the ethical movement and the labor church, but they did, as I said before, they tried to um, develop their own culture. Having said this, they just couldn't escape um, religion and the religious culture from, from which they had come. And, and that's uh, true to say for the socialist movement more broadly is that the importance of religion in the 19th century was impossible to escape. It was a part of the, the way that these generationally people understood um, themselves. And so it's unsurprising, for instance, you can see there, there were 10 socialist Sunday school precepts um, and they also had a declaration there. And so they borrowed heavily from church style, Sunday school style um, meetings, even though they were very clear that they were not a Sunday school, they were a socialist Sunday school. So there was a lot of singing, um, recounting um, the precepts, singing again, maybe a lesson, singing again. Um, so I think you're getting the gist of it. A typical session would also involve an opening aspiration and so some schools might be a little bit more radical like the college socialist sunday school in glasgow for instance they had the precept um, or the opening aspiration he who allows oppression shares the crime um, and some were a little bit more mild-mannered such as paisley socialist sunday schools which is the better days can only come as we can do our best today so it really depended on the local socialist culture as to how far they really pushed some of the, um, the um, politics of the day. Um, I will move now to this alternative construction of childhood. And I think you're probably getting the sense of this, the way that they were trying to create this space of alternative childhood culture. They had their own um, birthday cards, naming ceremonies. I mean, the socialists at the time even had their own alternative weddings. It was really about replacing what they had known with something completely new. Um, the schools also aimed to affirm and celebrate um, working class childhood as distinct and protected period of life. Um, and so you can see here, um, uh, some responses to the state schooling system and also um, mention here of the seditious teaching bill which was read but not voted on in Parliament um, so heard but not passed in Parliament and um, uh, this was about changing the definition of sedition um, uh, which really threatened the function of the schools as well as a number of other um, activities of the socialist movement at the time. Um, in developing the alternative practice of childhood, they were really connected to nature and internationalism. They had, you can see there, the Young Socialist, the magazine of justice and love. Um, and they saw nature as a way to respond to the harsh and grim realities of city and industrial life. They would go on rambling adventures and they would try and go on excursions to nature. And you can see here, apologies for the bad image, but it's a beautiful piece, which is um, designed by Walter Crane, a famous children's illustrator at the time, who was also very much involved in the Socialist Sunday School movement. But you can see here this socialist reimagining of May Day celebrated as a socialist day of renewal in which children are the harbingers for the possible socialist future. And I'll end with a couple of photos here of the schools themselves, um, Levens Humes Social Sunday School, but then also Patterson um, School in New Jersey, the US. There was a lot of international connections between the schools and um, dialogue in the Young Socialist. And I guess um, if I had to say one thing about the movement, I would say that their significance lies in that creation of an alternative childhood that attempted to both sit outside of the heady sectarianism of adult socialist politics and to counter 
militaristic versions of childhood, such as what was seen in the Scouts at the time, um, heavily religious and um, uh, empire-driven versions of childhood as seen in the schooling system at the time. So I will leave it there. I, I hope you found this interesting. Um, I, I'm just, as I said, I'm delighted to be um, presenting this and I um, maybe one day I will come and visit. Okay, thank you for listening. So thanks very much to uh, Jessica for that presentation, uh, which I think gives us a really great introduction to the Socialist Sunday School movement. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Ruth Ewan. Um, Ruth Ewan is a Glasgow-based artist um, whose 2012 project, The Glasgow Schools, focused on the Socialist Sunday School movement in a Glasgow context. And Ruth, I should have enabled you to share, but if you can't, just say and I'll Great. make sure it okay. works. Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay, right. Let me just get this PowerPoint up. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah? Yes. Cool. Okay, I shall start. So this isn't from the Socialist Sunday School, but I thought it was appropriate um, given the context. Um, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me um, quite last minute to take part in this event. And um, it's really nice to do something for the uh, anniversary of the occupation of the baths because I realise I wrote about the occupation of the baths as part of my art school dissertation um, 19 years ago now. Uh, and I found the story of it really inspirational. And uh, my own daughter actually learned to swim in the training pool there when it was open. Um, a few years ago. So yeah, it's really nice to be involved in something. Um, I'm very excited about the development there. Um, and so I thought I would, um, that was a really nice introduction there from Jessica, a, a sort of overview of the UK movement. And so I'm going to zoom in now onto um, Glasgow and um, talk a bit about a project that I made um, back in um, 2012. I guess I worked on it from um, 2010 and then it was shown in 2012. Um, it's a project called the Glasgow Schools. Um, so I work independently as an artist and a lot of my work is really um, comes out of quite in-depth um, research, often historic research into hidden um, histories. And some of those histories have touched on alternative education movements and the Socialist Sunday Schools being one of those. And um, I first came across um, the Socialist Sunday Schools when I was visiting um, the Working Class Movement Library in Salford. Um, and I think around 2005, um, I, I have an archive of political music and I was looking for song sheet, sheet music there. Um, and the archivist there uh, very generously showed me um, this book that he thought I'd be interested in called the Proletarian Songbook. Uh, and I'd never seen anything like it. It was um, pretty uh, red hot stuff. And it was um, published in Glasgow in the 1920s by a man called Tom Anderson. Um, and at that, that same time, he showed me some of his other um, publications, um, the Proletarian Catechism. Um, and I was really, as, as a visual artist, I was really, um, quite seduced by some of the um, sort of slogans and graphics that Tom Anderson was using this ours is the world despite all um, graphic which I particularly loved um, and I've come to reference quite quite a lot. Um, I looked at the Socialist Sunday School songbook and, and so this material really stuck in my head and then in um, 2010 I was invited by um, Kitty Anderson who at the time was um, part of an organization based in Glasgow called the Common Guild. Um, and another curator, Siobhan Carroll, and they invited me to um, create a project for the Common Guild um, that was commissioned um, for Glasgow International in 2012. And as soon as they invited me, I, I knew that what I wanted to do was explore the Socialist Sunday Schools and the Proletarian Schools in Glasgow. Um, at, at the time I was living in London, in um, East London in Walthamstow, which was coincidentally where one of the early Sunday schools was based, um, the Sunday school um, that was run by William Morris and Walter Crane. 
And so I was able to do a bit of research there, but also come up to Glasgow regularly. Um, and I didn't know, as, as often is the case when I start projects, I don't know where those projects are going to take me. Um, I went into this research thinking I would kind of create something in response to the, to the material I discovered. But I, I soon realized once I started to delve that there was a lot more there than what those appeared to be on the surface. I felt like there was a history that was latent and it was yet to be explored. And so many people in Glasgow um, got in touch. They heard that this project was taking place. They got in touch and they put calls out to people as well. And because people who'd, who'd been to sun, the Sunday schools or had relatives who'd been to them tend to still be in touch with each other, it all this sort of network um, appeared of people. Um, and I started to interview these, those people. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating to hear firsthand and really collect this oral history um, of a movement that um, to begin with, you know, I started off with, with um, quite a superficial interest in a lot of the graphic material. And then I was became much more deeply interested in the aims of the movement and assessing the value of the movement itself, really, and thinking about, um, I could see that it had been um, criticized or kind of thought of on quite a superficial level. It, it had been cited as a failed experiment, this movement, and um, something that was quite um, quirky and unusual, a sort of oddity from history, if you will. That, um, and I went into it thinking, is, well, is this quite right? I was quite open-minded really about it. And my assumptions were really challenged by the people who I met. And I came, came away think, understanding it to be something hugely um, valuable um, and hugely important in the shaping of individuals, and um, particularly the people who I spoke to in Glasgow and, and those who had moved beyond um, this is um, the beautiful um, illustration by Walter Tr Crane, which we've seen already in an early copy of the Young Socialist um, magazine, which you can see in, through some of the images that I'll show you. The, the style of it really evolves. Um, this is um, an illustration by F.J. Bourne, um, who I think Jessica uh, mentioned in her presentation. And these are one of the naming um, certificates um, so there was there was a um, process of kind of welcoming into the Sunday school, which one of the um, pu former pupils talks about in, in the film, The Glasgow Schools, which we'll show an excerpt of. And um, the film's online if anyone wants to watch the rest of it. It's about half an hour long. Um, and uh, Mary um, Gowers, who is a relative of Caroline here, talks in a lot of detail about the ceremony itself, um, which really reflected a sort of Christian naming ceremony. Um, these are the Ten Commandments from um, the Vestry House Museum in Walthamstow. And what I find really interesting looking at the um, Ten Commandments is that, well, they start off being called, or you can see here, the Ten Commandments, then they become the Socialist Commandments. And um, later on, um, when the schools in the 60s become um, known as the um, Socialist Fellowship Schools. Those um, commandments become um, precepts um, and they're rewritten, they're, they are kept up to date at all times and they are, they are revised um, by the members. This is the later Socialist Precepts and Declaration card and the badge from the Socialist Fellowship. So um, what I came to realise once I undertook the project was my understanding from what I'd read was that the movement um, sort of petered out in the um, late 60s. And I think Jessica mentioned the early 70s, but um, from the people that I interviewed in the project, um, it's evident that in Glasgow, the F Socialist Fellowship was actually active um, until 1980. And these pages are signed TA. This is Tom Anderson of the the proletarian um, schools. And he um, was someone who um, had a very um, radical outlook. Um, he was a revolutionary socialist 
and there was indeed a, a sort of schism within the the socialist school movement and the proletarian school was um very much to the left of the the socialist Sunday school um movement it's in its early days um the proletarian schools were from the 1910s up into the 1930s um, and Tom Anderson was actually from what I understand he was quite uh, um, well to do um, man or became quite a, a well to do man who put a lot of his own personal um, wealth as a draper in Glasgow into establishing the proletarian school and he very interestingly he was also writing um, a lot of material uh, under the pseudonym um, Margaret Dobson um, and he was really at the forefront of sex education um, and his um, pamphlets under under that name I think a lot of them were um, destroyed as illicit materials but um, looking at them now um, really super super interesting there's some in the Marx Memorial um, Library in London and when we did the Glasgow Schools exhibition um, a fantastic um, researcher and archivist Jane Rosen gave a talk on um, Tom Anderson and she talks in detail about his life as Margaret Dobson. And um, I think the, those talks that we commissioned are still available on the Common Guild um, website. We can perhaps share a link for that with everybody. So you can see here top right, this is um, an image from, from Govan Hill's Socialist Sunday School. So there was, there were schools right across um, in Glasgow. Um, I think the later, in, with the fellowship, I think the, the later schools that were still active were in Castle Milk and Fossil. Um, you can see bottom right, there's, I think this is a, a sort of celebration. It's probably a, from a May Day demonstration that where they celebrate in the countries of the world. There was a real sort of internationalist um, perspective that the, the school tried to foster. And, one of the things that um, the pupils really spoke about a lot, and when I asked them about their experiences there, there was there was this element of you know learning by rote with the, the precepts and the declaration and these things. And one one pupil spoke about these things going into his DNA. They were asked to recite them so much, um, but alongside that, there was this really massively enriching um, cultural experience, and a lot of that came through annual events like May Day and. And um, some of the pupils also spoke about Halloween as something that was really important. Um, but there was also the sort of sense of opportunity that was afforded to the kids and um, that were attending the schools. Um, one, um, people spoke about going quite bizarrely and um, going on a flight from um, Edinburgh, you know, from Glasgow to Edinburgh Airport and back again in a day um, with the, the Sunday school because, um, the, the teacher wanted to give the kids the experience of going on an aeroplane for the first time. So they went on this 15 minute plane journey <laughs> and walked along Princess Street and then came back again. This is Springburn Socialist School. So a lot of this material that I'm showing you, some of it we borrowed from um, places like the Marx Memorial Library, also from Glasgow Museums, um, hold a considerable about, amount of material. Um, but we also borrowed a lot from personal collections. And I think for the exhibition, we, we ended up borrowing some like 145 items. And these are all from proletarian schools published by Tom Anderson. And this is from the um, Mitchell Library here in Glasgow. This is really incredible. Um, scrapbook that belonged to Tom. This is a list. So this is really interesting because it shows you a list of where all these proletarian schools were. And you can see they were really um, springing out of the sort of working class and more like industrial areas, um, particularly in um, Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, and in Fife, where I grew up, actually, I was fascinated to see that there was some in Fife around the sort of mining communities there. Um, another aspect of the schools that I find really interesting is that um, pupils were very keen to point out that within the movement, they were constantly told that 
there was no second class citizens um, and gender equality was clearly something that was articulated very early on and and from what I understand way before it was of importance in um, British state schools I when I know it from my own experience of school that up until the late 70s where, where the school that I attended taught um, car maintenance to boys on that Friday afternoon when they taught um, how to clean the house properly to girls and um, you know the, the Sunday schools weren't doing that at all they really regarded boys and girls to be of a sort of equal footing So these are some stills from the exhibition and um, the exhibition was held at Scotland Street School Museum, which is a really beautiful Charles Rennie Macintosh um, building that's right next to um, the um, Shields Road subway. Um, I was living in London at the time, actually, I've ended up living very near um, the school. Um, and I think the reason I moved to Glasgow was partially because I had such an amazing experience working on this project and I encountered such sort of warmth and openness um, working on the project. Um, so the exhibition contained a lot of archive material, there were some trophies um, from the Sunday schools and you can see there there's quite a badly installed monitor in the background um, which showed the film um, which is now available um, to, to view online. And we did find um, a banner that was in someone's possession that they lent us. Unfortunately, it wasn't a really beautiful banner with the dove on it, but I kind of like the utilitarian design of this one. And um, so you'll see from this picture that there's another room beyond the exhibition space. And that became a really useful space that we used to hold events. So the exhibition was on for around a month. Um, and every Sunday we programmed an uh, event um, to reflect the, the, Sunday, the idea of this sort of Sunday school session. These are Tom Anderson's scrapbooks again. And these are copies of the Young Socialist magazine, which is re really incredible um, to, to look at the, the journey from that sort of 1900 right up until the late 60s, the evolution and how it um, aesthetically, I think how how it um, starts to build in the children's voice and the children's artwork and the children's own means of expression. Um, I've I've got some of these young socialist um, magazines and um, apparently Keir Starmer was involved in young socialist um, magazine. I keep meaning to look and see if his name is on any of the drawings that were sent in. Um, what was also really beautiful that we, we came across with these um, minutes that were taken by the children. So the children were encouraged to, to um, take minutes themselves. They learned how to chair a meeting, how to take a vote. Um, and that's something that's spoken about a lot in the film as well. So it was really, um, what I was starting to say earlier was there was this sense of um, learning by rote, but then there was also this sense of empowerment at the same time and really encouraging independent um, thinking from the children. We found the library list from college um, Socialist Sunday School um, when we were researching and I thought it'd be really interesting to um, recreate that sort of mini library. And these, so these are all works of fiction um, that have some kind of socialist-ish message within them. So there's books by, um, there's a lot of Jack London, um, Dickens, um, H.G. Wells, and these were the sort of books that the children were encouraged to read. So there's this real cultural dimension to it. And this is George Aitken on the left, who was really a um, valuable contributor to the project. And this is the beautiful banner I mentioned with the dove. So we'd found the um, illustration, which I showed earlier, the banner design. And then what was so satisfying was we found some footage of May Day, what some of the participants, um, the bars, um, gave us this cine film that we had digitized. And then we saw the actual banner in its full glory. And the exhibition was opened by the Lord Provost at the time, Bob Winter, who'd gone to, to socialist school himself. 
Um, and we also produced, as well as the film, um, we produced a pamphlet and events program featuring a sort of overview of the project um, and also a couple of um, commissioned texts and um, one by um, Fred Reed um, and one by Brian Moore, who is a, a former student as, alongside a text um, by Jane Rosen on Tom Anderson and the proletarian schools. Um, this is the brilliant um, actor Tandine Barn doing a reading. Um, so this was one of our Sunday school events at the museum. Um, we found a monologue in the Mitchell Library. Um, I cannot remember the author's name now, but it was it's a really stirring monologue about Tom Anderson and how he became um, politicised through witnessing um, poverty as a child in Glasgow. And this is a really wonderful lady um, called Anne, and she was the only person um, who we met um, who had attended a proletarian school. And so she remembered Tom Anderson and we were able to um, record her recollecting what he was like. She describes him buying the children clothes um, and asking them to scrawl PSS for proletarian um, su Sunday school on the, on the pavement in chalk. This is a wonderful lady called um, Charlotte, who um, was a former pupil and went on to become, um, I think she was a music teacher and she really got involved in the project. She did an interview, but she also led a singing session with the Sunday School Songbook. Um, George Aitken had a whole box of these um, uh, songbooks and he just handed them out to the room and he didn't even want people to give them back. He was just, he was so generous. He was, handed them out to everybody. They're quite valuable things, quite very rare things. Um, and we had this fantastic and really quite moving um, singing session that Charlotte led. And this is um, Ian Savile, who's a frequent collaborator of mine. He's a, a socialist uh, magician. He's a really fantastic writer as well. Um, he gave us his um, socialist magic show. This is him doing some ventriloquism with Karl Marx. And what was great about this was that it really worked for all these sort of generations of people who were there. And this is Jane doing her talk on um, Tom Anderson. Since um, doing the Sunday School project, I've, I've quite recently learned that um, Jenny Lee, who's someone I'm really interested in, who is, was one of the um, founders of the Open University and was really crucial in the formation of um, the Arts Council of England. And um, so she was a, a Labour MP and she was from Fife and she um, had also attended um, Socialist Sunday School herself. And this is her um, so she was married to Nye Bevan, um, and this is her um, Socialist Sunday School hymn book. You can see it's got her, her dad's name stamped into it. Um, and so just before we watch a bit of the film, I thought I would finish with some of the aims of the, the schools. And so they set out that for the aims to be to teach children to think for themselves and to feel themselves to be part of a great community of workers. In short, the immediate purpose of the Socialist Sunday School as an institution is to supply the socialist movement with fearless, capable and conscientious, conscientious thinkers, um, which I think, um, if we're assessing it in terms of its aims, I think that is something um, that they highly succeeded in. Um, so if you want to, Catherine, if you want to play the wee clip that I sent you from the film, perhaps we can just finish up with that. Thanks so much, Ruth. That was brilliant, uh, especially on such short notice, as you said. I'll just uh, queue up your film here. There were there were Sunday schools still still in existence when I was going. There were Sunday schools in Castle, Castle Milk, Milk and I think there might have been one in Springburn as well, but I'm not sure. But certainly Castle Milk, we kind of interacted yeah. with, yeah. you know, at meetings and you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember Castle. I remember possibly being that's, along. That's right, that right. was that. I think that was quite a quite a large one at the time. So I think when I was about three, that would be 1940. That's almost the dark ages, isn't it? Uh, we started going to the, the school in Maryhill because my mum's brother and his family were involved in that. 
after the war, they donated it to the local authority, Glasgow Corporation. And then Pollock Socialist Sunday School got a let in there on a Sunday to have their meetings. There would be maybe hundreds, maybe more than that, children went there on a Sunday. I just remember getting up on the, the Sunday and going. Oh, that's just it. Yeah. That's what you did yeah. on Sunday yeah. morning at yeah. 10 o'clock? Yeah. That's 10 through to 12, 12. 12 on a Sunday, and that's mm -hmm. just what you did on your Sunday. And we met in small hall, I think the Labour Party rooms. Fabulous. We had the precepts, the declarations. We were allowed to run the meetings. We were taught how to, shape, to chair a meeting, how to put forward motions, how to, to vote, how to write minutes, and generally involved in the kind of political process of running meetings. The thing that you would have been most struck about if you had been able to accompany me there was um, that they looked very like, I wouldn't say mirror images of, but very like church services. As the name Socialist Sunday School implies, um, there would be, you know, a superintendent at the front, everybody be sitting in rows, um, children at the front, adults at the back. Uh, we would stand up and sing songs that were hymn-like in their uh, sort of wording. Um, we would um, be asked to repeat the socialist precepts, the ten socialist precepts, which had once been known as the Socialist Ten Commandments. The movement began in the 1890s, at least in Glasgow, Yorkshire and London, uh, among uh, groups of people who were disillusioned with uh, Christian orthodoxy and um, wanted to, something that would express an ethical, spiritual dimension in their lives. The Sunday School movement had their own precepts and declarations, um, which basically were learned by heart. Repeating the precepts and the declarations were built into the agenda every Sunday. Um, uh, so that you had that kind of formal uh, memory learning of the principles of socialism. Socialist precepts to be remembered. Be friendly to your school fellows, remembering that they will be your fellow workers in life. Do not hate or speak evil of when anyone. Do not be revengeful, uh, but uh, stand up for your rights and resist oppression. Do not think that those who love their own country must hate and despise other nations or wish for war, which is a remnant of barbarism. Uh, remember that all the good things of the earth are produced by labour. Whoever enjoys them without working for them is stealing the bread of the workers. Observe and think in order to discover the truth. Do not believe what is contrary to reason and never deceive yourself or others. We would stand up to say that we will now stand to say the precepts. Were there set precepts that we had to do? I, I, I remember so you knew some more than others, I have to say. You, and I don't, at the time, you knew the most by I don't, I don't remember going through all ten. No, week. I just... No, it was, it was, I always remember just saying something about we desire to be just and well, loving. Was that at the end? That was the, end. Was that the declaration? Was that the declaration? Right, that's what I'm getting muddled up with precepts and declarations. I think the precepts you were just encouraged, and if you knew uh -huh. one, to know them. You know, to I know don't, them, you were yeah, encouraged to shout out. And the declaration. It was the declaration at the end that we did. It was like a paragraph worth uh -huh. or something. Uh -huh. And that was, that was a kind of final. Closing to all my to work together, brothers and sisters. The creature. And so, so help to, to form, form a new society, society where justice, justice is the foundation and love is the law. law. And that was it. And that was it. Cheerio. <laughs> amen. Did we say amen? No, no, no. no we didn't say amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to Ruth for sharing that. Sorry to stop it so abruptly. Um, I'd really recommend that you uh, watch the rest of the film. I'm actually just going to post the link in the chat. Um, uh, it's about half an hour long and it's really brilliant and just shows the, yeah, the wealth of memories that people have of attending the, 
Socialist Sunday Schools. Um, um, now, um, you heard uh, Professor uh, Fred Reed there um, um, giving some background to the schools, and Fred joins us this evening. Um, so, um, Fred, I was wondering whether you want to uh, say a few words, either your memories of working with Ruth or of the schools or um, whatever you want. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, to be honest, it's, it's, it's so moving. I mean, I'm 83 now. It's so moving to be taken back to those times I joined College Social Sunday School just before the end of the Second World War in 1944, when I was uh, really quite a nipper. I suppose I was seven at that time. And um, when, when people were reeling off their precepts there, I, 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 my flesh was tingling because they're so still so inspiring, these uh, sentiments that, you know, we... we, we were ingrained into us by that process. I mean, people often condemn rote learning. I'm quite a defender of rote learning in, in, due, in due moderation because I think it uh, can uh, implant things that remain permanently with you. I mean, we, some of us, nearly all of us, I suppose, can remember poems that we learned at school that were particularly inspiring and, and got into the grain of our personality, as it were. Uh, so that that that's the thing for me, and um, everything that's been said, both by Jessica, was it the first speaker, and by Ruth, um, it rings, you know, absolutely true. It, it gets the it gets the quality with the the informality of the relationship between the adults and the children. We all called each other by our first names. Um, the, the the rambles, the, the introduction to nature. Uh, all, all, all that is absolutely part and, and very emotionally part of, the, of my young life and has remained with me. I think I would just add that it's slightly misleading to say that the uh, disputes among socialists didn't enter into the Sunday schools. What is right, and Jessica emphasised this, I thought absolutely correctly, the um, the adults didn't take it to the children. They, they, they didn't argue it out in front of the children, but they certainly argued it out very vigorously among themselves. And before the First World War, there was quite a mini pamphlet war between those who held to what was called the idealistic vein of socialism, which believed that socialism was an ethic about love and loving one another and so on. Um, and those who believed, like the Lancashire Socialist Sunday Schools especially, that socialism was a science, a science of society. And if you understood the science of society, you would see that socialism was inevitable and there was quite a quite a vigorous argument went on between them. The loving school, the ethical school, as they tended to call themselves, got defeated by the First World War. I mean, how could you believe that there was a universal principle of love in the universe after the Western Front? And uh, the schools became dominated, really, by the... Um, revolutionary socialists in the Communist Party and the, um, what would you call them, the, 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 the left Labour uh, socialists of the ILP. There were some Labour Party members in, active in socialist Sunday schools, but mainly they were ILPers and later communists who were to the fore. And um, there is evidence, I'm afraid, that there was quite a lot of ideological dissension between them from the 1930s onwards and it became quite a serious uh, during the uh, during the Cold War and I, I, I've argued in the piece I wrote for Ruth um, that uh, it, it contributed very seriously to the to the decline of the movement uh, but that's that's not to detract in any way from what Jessica was emphasising, that we children were not exposed to that. You know, the, the, this, this, this went on in the, in the adult meeting, as it was called. Um, but that, that, these, these are the things that I, I, want, I wanted to say. 
Thanks very much, Fred. That's brilliant. And we're so glad that you can join us. And I think, would it be fair to say that uh, your attendance at the Socialist Sunday Schools shaped your future and your future career? Would that be a fair thing to say? It's, it, 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 it very much implanted the importance of education. I mean, somebody was quoting precept number eight, observe and think in order to discover the truth. Do not believe what is contrary to reason and never deceive yourself or others. I mean, that just, you know, went into the green with me and uh, the, the pursuit of education became a uh, it just got stronger and stronger with me, so that and there was never anything else I wanted to do. But uh, well, there was almost never anything else I wanted to do but to be a university teacher. That's brilliant, and you can really see the, I guess, the benefits of rote learning there. That you still remember it so clearly, even after all these years. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> It's very emotional to, 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 to be taken back to these times. Mm, I can imagine. Thank, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. And I'm sure you'll come back again at the discussion at the end. Um, now we'll move on to uh, another presentation, this time by Professor David Kitchener. Uh, David joins us this evening. Uh, and David's going to be talking about uh, the approaches to teacher, teaching and learning found in the Socialist Sunday Schools. Uh, this is another pre-recorded uh, talk that was just to avoid any issues with Zoom. So I'll just set that going. Good evening, everybody. My name's David Kitchener, and I'm here to explore with you the approaches to teaching and learning within the Socialist Sunday Schools. So you've already heard from Jessica, and now I'll be looking at the radicalism from a different angle. But first of all, a big, big thank you to Catherine Midgley. It's very, very kind of you to invite me here. And welcome all again. Let's have, we have a good evening. I'll take questions at the end. I feel free to ask whatever you want. All the best, Rory, and thank you for being here. When exploring and understanding the extent and influence of the Sunday School movement in terms of... Um, the way they approach teaching and learning. Just to put it in context, it, it wasn't a small number here. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of children that actually were exposed to what I explained later was quite radical in the, the approach to teaching and learning. For example, when Mary Gray began them in 1892, it was very small, but it soon, soon expanded and grew and grew uh, all over Europe, particularly in New York as well all over the country. Uh, Glasgow in particular was very, very strong. Uh, Glasgow had 83 schools. Um, Scotland was quite radical, particularly the area you, you live in. And so it's interesting to see, we're not talking here about a very small number, a small number of children uh, exploring these quite different ways and perspectives of understanding society. We're talking here about something quite significant and influential and important. So we have then hundreds of children attending and exploring the ideas of socialism within a Sunday school. Now this is very, very different to traditional, say, Victorian and Edwardian Sunday schools that actually looked at the ideas of an obedience to an omnipotent God. This was different in many, many, many ways. And of course, as Jessica would have mentioned, this was in a pit of the absolute firm belief in the correctness of the British Empire and the dominance of Britain in the world. And so God was very much part of the idea of the strength of the civilization of the British and their right to rule over goodness knows how, how many people. So to actually produce an alternative was very, very different indeed. So from what position did the National Association of Socialist Sunday Schools approach teaching and learning? Well, it's very, very radical. I mean, this is the quote from their actual pamphlet of the which was distributed and was the basis for all of the schools. 
Do you realise that the false ideals of a capitalist society are reflected in the teaching of our day schools and orthodox Sunday schools? Poses the question. And very interestingly, I wonder if, how many of you think about your own childhood and your own learning and even you know your, your children's children learning and so on. How many of them uh, actually explore or attempt in any sense whatsoever to challenge the orthodoxy of the present understanding of a society which is materialistic, consumer driven and of course capitalist. Um, the happy answer chances are is no. This was significantly different. This was posing new questions for children to consider in their learning. As I mentioned before the Socialist Sunday School movement was international. This is a photograph of um, one from New York. Um, one thing that was particularly radical even at that period was that boys and girls were taught together. They met on a Sunday but the instruction or exploration of the issues was non-secular and the whole idea behind them was to develop new ideas of teaching and learning of the principles of socialism. So whilst there were phrases which smack of traditional Christian type Sunday schools, the actual point about them was that they were actually more interested in the principles of looking and working together on socialist principles of kindness and decency. Osborne talks them as about just being sort of labour sex, but that's not really fair, I don't think, because they actually were more interested in spreading the ideals of a change, or a radical change in society towards socialist principles. And they had commandments, seven commandments, but they weren't anything like the commandments really of the Christian. Uh, for, for example, number seven was remember that all good things of the earth are produced by labour. Whoever enjoys them without working for them is stealing the bread of the workers. This is not Christian Sunday school teaching. This is socialist and this is actually radical in the sense that they were looking towards levering children into the future in creating a different society rather than a traditional Sunday school which would be interested in maintaining the status quo and obeying the commands of an instructive and all-powerful God. Here we have a slide of a typical Victorian classroom and as you can see, female in this case, so a single gender and the school mom, who in those days wasn't allowed to be married, would be in charge and you would be given instruction. You wouldn't be taught as such, you would be given instruction. The world would be explained to you and you would agree to it. Now, to, in the socialist Sunday schools, teaching and learning approaches were different. If you're going to actually encourage children to be cooperative, supportive, kind, compassionate, decent and moral and so on, then one way of instilling that within people is allowing people the freedom not simply to receive knowledge but also to actually challenge and explore knowledge. So for example George Whitehead of the Hyde Socialist Sunday School Committee summarised the ideals of teaching should be based upon individual interests the lesson should be graduated. That's, that's radical, graduated. In other words, mixed, we call it mixed ability now. The teaching should also engender discussion and encourage questions and expression of opinion. Uh, the idea would be in that, therefore, that the lesson should encourage individual unfoldment. And therefore, they're not dogmatic. The teaching and learning in these schools was very, very, very different. We would call it nowadays child-centred learning. This was a hundred years before this actually came into action in the Plowden report. So this is really very different. The experience for these children would be absolutely the antithesis of what would happen in their school environments in weekday lessons. 
Again, unusually for this period of history, the Socialist Sunday Schools determined there would be absolutely no corporal punishment whatsoever. The association felt that punishment of any kind was worse than useless. So with the children, the idea was to nurture, to provide understanding, to explore concepts. And the idea of punishing people for being wrong was the antithesis of the philosophy of the actual work involved within the school. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. Now, nobody, nobody was even thought of as being punished. The idea being that they were rewarded for their good deeds. The National Association of Socialist Schools were highly critical of the weekly schooling experience, arguing that it was based on empire building, military arrogance, false ideas as to what should constitute manly dignity by giving inflated values to royal personages, history dealing mainly with the sanguinary exploits of kings and queens. And therefore, contrary to the weekday experience, the children were being invited to explore ideals that contested the main discourse within state education. State education were particularly insistent and didactic in establishing within children the concept of own your place, working towards empire, supporting British imperialism and the right and correctness of that position as Britain as an imperial force. This was being taught as a lie by the Socialist Sunday Schools and again we have clear radicalism in the approaches to teaching here. In 1970, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paul O'Friere was published in English, an influential book that changed many people's views of the function, purpose and construction of education, not just in Britain, but certainly within the world. In many ways, the Socialist Sunday Schools actually preempted Friere's work. They were saying the same type of thing, but something like 70 or 80 years before that. And again, just to emphasise how radical this approach was. So essentially, this is Friere's hypothesis, and it reflects very much the position of the Socialist Sunday School movement. Freire argued that the system of education was designed to ensure maintenance of the status quo. People were therefore invited into education essentially to reinforce their class position. The teacher, who reflected authority and the establishment and the view of the ruling class, was the person who provided the knowledge and the children were seen as empty vessels to be filled with that knowledge. The teacher therefore provided the knowledge, assessed the knowledge and the more the children agreed, the more correct they were. The knowledge was based upon the position of the status quo and therefore the position of the entitlement of the ruling classes to maintain their position this was the oppression. So the more the teacher provided in terms of knowledge and the more the children read, the more they were rewarded and the greater the likelihood they were progressing within society. They were conforming to what society wanted, expected and demanded. To challenge such a position was therefore considered a threat and therefore you were wrong. I'm the teacher, I have the knowledge, I have the assessment, I am correct. If you want to progress, then you agree with me. If you do not agree with me, you are wrong. And this was pedagogy of the oppressed. This is Freire's position. And this, obviously, from what I've been telling you, is very much the socialist Sunday school idea of mainstream education 
ensuring the workers were kept oppressed, were ensuring that their views, their entitlements were never met. This was significantly interesting and very, very, very different. So, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you enjoyed a quick overview of the teaching and learning within the Socialist Sunday School movement. Thank you for listening and I hope now that you'll be able to answer, ask some questions, which I'll have a go at answering. All the best everybody and thank you for listening. So thanks very much to David for that brilliant presentation, which gives another angle on our understanding of the, the Sunday School movement. Um, I'd now like to call on uh, Bernie and Moira Began, um, who have some um, artifacts from their collection uh, relating to socialist Sunday schools. And um, Bernie and Moira, for those who don't have access to video, it, would it be all right for you to describe the objects that you're showing, uh, as well as showing them to the camera? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, you should put this off, Bernie. You just muted yourself again. You were, yeah, you I are mean, unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Learners at the Zoom, yeah, Gavin. Um, yeah, Bernie's here beside me. Um, I'm getting the short straw to speak to you. I feel intimidated by the huge knowledge that everybody else has of the Social Sunday School. And we can't really add much to that background at all. Um, Bernie's interest in mine mainly was in the um, trade union movement to start with, you know, collecting badges and memorabilia and that. And what's come through the contribution so far is, yeah, there's a huge overlap there. So people would find badges and things and think, oh, they might be trade union badges and pass them on uh, to, to me and Bernie and they would be, they'd be the cooperative movement or suffragette movement uh, sometimes, you know, Labour Party and um, the ILP, things like that, you know. They, Workers' Education Association, and that's really where these little badges that we have that um, came from. Um, I can hold one up so that people haven't got video. One was just that that Ruth had shown in picture. There was a socialist um, fellowship badge. If I can just, I'll hold it up like that. If those who have a video to see it, it's not really great, but it's here. If anybody ever wanted to have a look at it, um, and we didn't really know how much connected it was and that. And then the other little badges that you heard people mentioning, I don't know if you can see that really, if I hold it up to our camera. One is the lovely little motto that um, Fred and others mentioned about love and justice. It's a nice little badge. Another one, just a little thing with SSS on it, Socialist Sunday School. The other one has a little SSS in the middle and a torch, flaming torch there with love and justice around the side in um, and it's almost kind of suffrage type colours, you know, it's purple and gold and mm. pale green. So it's really, and you can see what, why people maybe thought that with our interest that these things would be connected. And they are because, you know, I mean, even up to yesterday, Bernie got an ILP badge on eBay. You know, there's things coming up all the time that are not just trade union, which is our main interest, but that come from other interests. Um, the other thing we have is we do have, and we have a, a number, and I think way back when we met Ruth the first time, have, we do have one of these little socialist Sunday school books. Can you see that coming up, uh, up there? Um, this one was printed in um, 1957, um, uh, it says, um, compiled by the National Council of British Socialist Sunday School Unions. So again, you've got that clear thing presented by the Glasgow Clarion Federation. The people that are interested in trade union labour movement will know the word Clarion as well because of the old labour cycling clubs and things uh, like that. The thing about this is it's just the lyrics of the songs. You know, we haven't got any music to, to go with the song. So when the little girl from Knits Hill says, well, we sang song number two, I have song number two in front of me. And I would love to know what the tune is if anybody has any of the music to go with the, the songs. But what it does is it, it's a strange little collection of things. I mean, the song number two is, oh, come children, come to the green, green fields, or oh, throw off the spell that the city wheels, for rich are the treasures the meadow yields to all on a bright summer's day. So there's that whole nature thing that Fred was talking about as well. And then other ones are quite 
Oh, they're quite coothy in a way. We think like, you know, we're a band of little comrades walking in the path of truth. We're marching onward, onward through the flowery land of youth, marching onward up to manhood, although they do respect girlhood as well, when we mean to join the fight of the weak against oppression in the battle for the right. And I love the, the chorus. It says, and we practice as we go and the little things we meet, carrying granny's parcel for her guiding blind men o'er the street, lifting up the fallen baby, helping mother all we may. Thus, as little duties meet us, we perform them day by day. But if you want all the words of the International, the Red Flag, the Marseillaise, Shelley's Men of England, all of the verses are in this little Sunday school because, well, could nobody ever knows more than the first verse, but they're there as well. And it ends even with a, a poem uh, by Keir Hardy. So they have quite serious things in it as well as some that are definitely directed towards children. And there's even a little bit at the end for special occasions. So um, that's really it. So with that, that's the, just the little things that we've picked up along the way that were connected to Social Sunday School. And then we knew about Ruth's exhibition in 2012 and found out about that. And some people we know in the trade union and labour movement who were Sunday School, Social Sunday School pupils as well. But you've had all the knowledge up till now, but these are just the little bits and pieces that are in that are in reality there for anybody who ever wanted to have a look at them or have their own songbook. Mm. Let can, us know. <laughs> can I say if anybody wishes a copy of this booklet, yeah, we have several copies mm. and we'd be more than welcome to pass them around if anybody wishes them. They can mm. always contact us. Yeah, through you if you want, Catherine, you do that. And if anybody has the music, yeah, you're welcome. And, and everybody, it's been absolutely fantastic hour. Wonderful, well done. Catherine, it's been superb, Thank really you. interesting. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. And I, I think I, I'll speak for Paul as well. We say we'd love to have one for our archive um, copy of the songbook. That would be brilliant. Yep. Um, I'm aware of the, the time ticking on. So I'm wondering, does anyone have any questions or comments or anything? There's a couple of options if, if you do. You can either, if you've got your video on, you can put your, put your hand up. Or if you've not got your video on, you can click reactions at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. Or you can simply type your question in the comments. Or if you're joining us by telephone, just feel free to put in. <laughs> so does anyone have any, anyone have any questions? David, go on, you can start us off. <laughs> it's not so much a question, but just to point out to everybody that uh, the present Conservative government have just um, agreed some legislation through the national curriculum that uh, prohibits the teaching of using the material any, any teaching material at all that is anti-capitalist mm. that's fascinating isn't it <laughs> so that's not the national curriculum for teaching and in england and wales we cannot use any material that um, is critical of capitalism now then how's that for the present day and the relevance of the, what socialist sunday schools do as an alternative that's powerful isn't it Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, the methodology next as well, because the methodology that Fred mentioned was absolutely it was so progressive and enlightening, and they don't want that kind of Thank thinking you. either. <laughs> yeah. I see Michael Sanders, you have your hand up, I don't know if you want to uh, come in here. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, thank you for organising this. It's been absolutely, you know, fabulous, really, really interesting. And I had a, a question for David, which is um, whether or not the, the kind of educational theory of the Socialist Sunday Schools owes anything to the Owenite Socialist Movement and to the Chartist Movement from earlier on in the 19th century. I don't know the answer, Michael, but I suspect the answer is yes because you can clearly recognise the uh, commonality between the two and the ideas of comradeship and support and help and, and working together and the same principles. So I don't know the answer, Michael, I'm sorry, but I suspect the answer is a definitely yes. There, seems to, there appears to be a continuity there. Don't, don't you feel that? Uh, definitely. I mean, I've done a, a little... Uh, my kind of big interest, I should say, is Chartism. And when you were talking about the refusal of corporal punishment, um, something yeah. that William Lovett wrote when he was talking about setting up charter schools was he said, oh, the, the first duty of the school teacher is to make the world a, is to make this classroom a little world of love. Yeah. And I thought, again, in comparison with 
most Victorian educational theory. That was an incredible kind of statement, a little world of love. That's the first priority. Uh, this is Fred here, Catherine. Um, yeah, there was a direct connection. The, the leading educationists in the pre-1914 movement, people like F.J. Gould, the positivist, and uh, above all, Margaret Macmillan, um, they quite consciously looked back to the earlier socialist tradition and uh, drew upon it, you know, to uh, to elaborate what they thought a uh, socialist education should be like. Uh, so, yeah, there's it's, it's, it's very definitely a link there. Thanks very much, Fred. I had a feeling you might you might be able to answer that one. Uh, I see Joey Simmons. Simons, you have your hand up there. Thanks. I was just a thing when uh, Jessica was talking up in her talk about this like alternative construction of childhood, and then um, David was mentioning about yeah, Paulo Freire and like this kind of nineteen seventy stuff that seemed to link back. But I just remember it came up like in that Ivan Illich like in that de schooling society book. I think it was in the seventies. He he kind of talks about this development of childhood as this kind of Victorian invention, and he he kind of like rejected. This idea, like in most cultures, you don't have this like sealing off of childhood and actually like a real radical education would kind of reject uh, this kind of idea. I can't, it was ages ago that I read it, but I can't remember exactly. So I don't know just what people thought about that, you know, that actually, yeah, his idea was it's more radical to kind of get rid of this concept of childhood that's kind of completely separate and that, you know, kids would learn, you know, working alongside their parents or in other situations. If that makes any sense. Or not. <laughs> okay. I'd, uh, sorry, go, then. Fred's going to have a go. Right. What's the idea of children? Right? Let's see. Pre what's it like? Pre Fred, are you, are you wanting to add something there? Well, that, that, that's actually a very interesting question. I'm just sitting here thinking about it. Um, like many things in life, it is and it isn't. Um, people have stressed up till now, the, the point is absolutely right, that they, they encourage free expression, a uh, questioning attitude, uh, and, and so forth. On the other hand, they were of their time, and they... They were nothing like as free as uh, children today would be, uh, for, for the most part. Um, you still had to be quite, um, uh, you, you know, you, you, your place as a child was very much uh, defined. Uh, the way you sat in, uh, you know, with all the children at the front on the cross benches and all the adults at the back, sort of... Um, you almost felt, you know, their attention boring into you, <laughs> and you knew that you you were under scrutiny. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's a complicated scene that, and uh, it's evolutionary. You know, you don't achieve everything all at once. They didn't just jump out of the Victorian idea of childhood into the modern idea. They they were in a a, a process of transition. Thanks very much, Fred. Um, my colleague Paula's uh, looking at the comments. Keep an eye. Paula, are there any questions coming up in the comments there? Oh, Paula, you're on mute. I, I think Fatima, can... have you got a question? Fatima? Uh, I Fatima's do have a question. Me. Hi, yes. I wanted to ask if um, there was any evidence, uh, I'm sure there is, of actually encouraging the young people to be involved in struggle. Or was it just the learning of um, a bit more of a passive thing? Or were they encouraged to actually join marches and rent strikes and, um, um, you know, maybe follow in support struggles of their parents, who I, I would presume were, would be militants at work. They wouldn't be passive themselves. So it, I know we, there's a wonderful history of children taking part in struggles because they're part of the labour force, but... What about the Sunday schools? Did they encourage the kids to go out and protest? Anyone know? From, from, from what I've read, Fatima, is that it, 
there was a national there was a national movement and a national magazine and the the, the ideology behind the organization of the schools was one which was based upon democratic principles and ownership and so on you know the basics of socialism so i'll get to your answer in a minute which means therefore that some of the actual centers were quite independent and, and thought differently there isn't a single answer to that when i was looking at uh, some of the stuff in the uh, in salford in the working class library there is that there, there were instances of extraordinary uh, international agreements on revolutionary action between Chorley in Lancashire and parts of the Bronx in New York, um, which you wouldn't expect, would you, at that period? And they were very involved in the ideals of um, actually forming and creating the new world through action. Others were quite like Osborne talks about labour sex, others were quite passive actually and talked more to do with the romance of kindness and gentleness and love and respect, uh, the softer principles of less scientific view of socialism. And so there was a whole spread. But to, to eventually answer your question, I think I don't have evidence of actual participation, but almost certainly they would be because a lot of them were trade union officials. The, the best example I came across was a school in Norfolk, in which was a school run, run by um, well, one, one of the, a, a Christian church. And the vicar got wind of uh, the stuff that was being taught on his premises by the Socialist Sunday School. And it was the same teacher who um, was in the day, in the week. And so he sacked her. And the, 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 the union got involved, and so the union therefore took the teacher out, the union paid her wages <laughs> at the school, the school carried on elsewhere, and, and one of the things that was on the curriculum was trade union studies, <laughs> and, and the vicar just had to sit and watch, he could do nothing about it. So the, yes, there are examples, aren't there? The, you know, what you can do with collective action, eh? I don't know. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, I've seen another, some other question in the comments. Can any of the speakers share any knowledge about Scottish suffrage activists who attended Socialist Sunday schools? I think that was mentioned in one of the presentations. I don't remember which one, though. I'd pass on that one, sorry. No. I think it was in Jessica's presentation, I think she mentioned it. Um, I, I don't know any direct um, links between suffragettes. I'm sure there will have been many who attended the schools. As I kind of keep on coming across through other research sort of intersecting histories of people who've attended um, the socialist schools and then gone on to become um, very important activists. So um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there are examples, but pretty hard to find it probably but somewhere like the working class movement library would probably be able to help with that may i say something or ask a follow-up that was my question if that's okay yeah sure go for it go for it thank you um thank you ruth for that and thanks again for the presentations what a delightful and amazing evening really tremendous um so one of my um colleagues in the protest and suffragettes project has just put i think in the chat that we know that agnes dolan was a mem went to socialist sunday schools and she was someone um who amongst other things co-founded um i believe the scottish socialist movement um but I'm not sure. We've been looking to find those links between suffrage and and the socialist Sunday schools, and I think there is quite a lot of there's a lot more to recover. I would say I did want to just share because I don't know if this is just based on the previous question. I don't know if this is is helpful, but in terms of evidence of people who were involved in who went to socialist Sunday schools and then became active. Um, there's a really gorgeous film called Red Skirts Clydeside, which has within it an interview of Mary Barber's granddaughters. And in that film, 
they say very specifically that she was, you know, she went to a naming ceremony, all of those things. And they spoke about um, all of the teaching of learning how to chair meetings, all the things that the speakers have spoken about so eloquently um, as being something that really influenced her and her own activism. So I just wanted to share that. It's not necessarily first, you know, it's not first round evidence because obviously it's her grandkids, but in case that's useful. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for there's sharing. A few things, oh, sorry, uh, Paula, go on. Sorry, there's a, just a few things in the chat. I'm not sure if everybody's keeping their eye on that chat, uh, but from Alex Wild, um, the youth organisation, the Woodcraft folk, has been explicitly providing a socialist education in the past, This, and she gives a, a link uh, from their archive. Um, someone was asking, is there specific books uh, that anyone could recommend? Let's just find it. There's, the, 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 I can't reckon. Um, the Jessica had some publications, but an online freebie, this is a, a push pusher, David Kitchen, the pusher, <laughs> if you wish, is that um, there's, I think it's based in um, St. Andrews um, University, and it's a magazine called Concept. So if you if you Google David Kitchener Socialist Sunday Schools, you'll find it. It's free. It's downloadable. It's a PDF. David Kitchener Socialist Sunday Schools and it's Concept Magazine uh, 216. And that's the stuff I've been talking about today. There's a lot of that's in there and Jessica's stuff in there. So uh, and that's free free download. Um, Scottish one too. So there you go. Concept Magazine. Could I ask a question, actually? Um, did the Socialist Sunday Schools ever advertise or publicise, like in socialist newspapers or even in Glasgow newspapers for people to attend? That was something that in, um, when we did our Govan Hill Suffrage Project that Claire Thompson volunteered on, we found a lot of information in the British newspaper archive about meetings that had happened in Govan Hill. I'm just wondering, is would they have advertised uh, the Socialist Sunday Schools in any of the press of the time? Ruth, do you know that one? Um, I, I've not seen particular um, newspaper advertisements. I have seen, you know, they produced flyers. Um, that I think I showed one in my presentation. It said, have you children? I think that was from the Socialist Fellowship. So they did produce a lot of flyers and things that they would hand out at particular demonstrations and rallies and so on. But, I, you know, I've not seen any particular um, newspaper advertisements. Thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, Paula, you want to come in again? Well, I was just going to say thanks. <laughs> um, I, I also have a question. I'm not sure uh, who's best place to answer it, but um, Jessica brought up the sedition bill um, that was targeting the socialist Sunday schools. And well, in relation to what David was saying about the, the new legislation in England and Wales preventing uh, anti-capitalist material from being used in schools, I was just wondering that sedition bill, was it uh, directly targeting the socialist Sunday schools or was it a, was it a broader bill? Like, does anyone know how that the bill came about really? It, it was um, mentioned in Parliament. I think um, Eric Barr talks about it in the Glasgow Schools film. He he quotes the the moment when it was when it was mentioned. Um, and and like with regard to the recent um, like piece of legislation, is is that just proposed at this stage, David? I remember reading about it at the time, but it hasn't actually passed through, has it, for England and Wales? Well, my understanding, I think it's gone to is it the green green paper stage or whatever. It's it's on the books and it's in a minute. So I don't think it's passed, but it, 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 I think it's going to happen. It's there um, with a massive majority. It'll happen, I'm sure. So like fly the bloody Union Jack, you know, it's just, it's, just, mm -hmm. it's just some sort of patriotic nonsense and mm -hmm. jingoism and nationalism and so on and so on and the teaching of kings and queens, which was the antithesis of what um, the socialist Sunday schools were up to. So. I think it's going to, sadly, um, it's, it's around the call, yes, it'll happen, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty shocking that there's not more uproar about it. I mean, I only saw one kind of fleeting article in the press about it months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, Fred, Fred might be trying to come in again. Fred, did you have something to add there? Um, 
Well, on the on the, the, the bibliography, you know, the, the books to read, um, I, I published a long time ago, 1966, I published an article in the International Review of Social History, which gives a detailed account of the history of the movement from 1892 to 1939. So any... A, any university library would certainly have a file of the International Review of Social History. And uh, if, if you uh, put in an interlibrary loan request through your local public library, you could easily get a copy of it. Um, it's a pity that Neil Rafik's uh, uh, PhD thesis was never published. I met Neil. Unfortunately, he died shortly after that. He died in a very untimely uh, way. But um, his, his uh, his his PhD thesis um, is well worth reading, but, but of course much more difficult to get. Thanks very much, Fred. I'll I'll um, put a link to your um, the the text that you mentioned in in the chat there. Uh, Paula, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just kind of trying to um, picture. Sure. Uh, I can, I can really understand the children at the socialist Sunday schools, um, but the adults were attending as well, so they were educating each other. Mm -hmm. the, there would be adult meetings and children's instruction, or what, what were they? How were the adults learning at the socialist Sunday schools? Should, should we talk about that one? The adults had their own separate meeting. It was called actually called the adult meeting, and it met. Um, I think, from my memory, they met monthly in, in both the Sunday schools I was involved in, in college social Sunday school, and later in Pollock social Sunday school. The adult meeting met monthly. I think it met, if I remember right, after the Sunday school meeting uh, on a one Sunday in the month. And of course, as I got older, I, I joined in with that. And that's where you know the arguments took place. And if you like, the, the self-education element uh, w was involved. Um, it, was, it, it was something that you graduated into as a, as a child member of Social Sunday School, if you, if you stayed with it long enough. That's brilliant. Thanks, Fred. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. I'm wondering if we have time for one more question or, or comment, if anyone has one. And someone earlier on, someone in the chat mentioned that Tom Anderson run the swimming club at the pool. Um, is, are you able to say a little bit more about that? I didn't realize that. It's really amazing. Oh, that was Bruce. Bruce is our resident amazing historian. Is he still here? Oh, yes, there you are. Tom Anderson uh, uh, I've, was a secretary, also the secretary of the Socialist Swimming Club, uh, and they operated out of uh, Govan Hill or Calder Street Baths, if you like. And uh, in the sort of late 1910s and early 20s, there's lots of articles in the newspaper uh, advertising for members, new members to come along and swim. Uh, and it, and, and no, it's noticeable, it's notable that uh, the Socialist Swimming Club was the first swimming club in Glasgow to allow mixed swimming. That was at Gov in Govan Hill in 1920. Uh, and, that, and that was the only place you could uh, do mixed swimming for about eight or nine years in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. wow. I never knew that, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. I'll, I'll let um, Jane Rosen know who's this expert on Tom Anderson. She'll be really interested in that. Oh, cool. Uh, thanks very much for for sharing that bruce um we're just about out of time i think um so i just want to say thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers uh, david ruth fred uh, moira and bernie and uh, jessica who is uh, not with us but is watching this via video later on um 
just to say, which I forgot to say at the beginning, but this talk is part of Occupy, 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 which you can see there on the poster, uh, which is our year-long celebration celebrating 20 years since the, um, since the occupation of the Govan Hill Baths building, which saved it from closure. And I'm delighted to say that in the last week, uh, construction work has started at the Baths building, which um, means that hopefully sometime next year, it'll reopen as a community wellbeing center. So it's a very exciting time um, to be involved with the Baths. Um, just to say as well that if you want to download the chat at the side, because there's quite a lot of uh, good links in there and things, um, if you go to the bottom where you would type something in there, you should see a little icon which says file, um, and then next to it there's three dots, and if you click on that you can see the option to save the chat, so you don't have to try and remember everything or scribble it down before it ends. Um, I think that's everything. So thanks very much to everyone. Thanks to my colleague Paula for helping out with the tech stuff. And um, please do join us for more Occupy events. Um, yeah, there's some really exciting things coming up. All right. Uh, take care, everyone.